I think you do provide an example of goodwill and of the goodwill of this community which made it possible for uh, the diverse multicultural society that you have here with intercultural engagement to develop over the past half a century. And I'm also very conscious that this community, as well as having migrant workers and a migrant community, also has migrants who are in effect asylum seekers, as Celeste reminded us, in the convent up the hill. So I, I think uh, what you provide us with really is a really unique example of what's possible. But I'd suggest to you that in providing us with that example, you're also telling us honestly that it's work in progress. And for me, that journey is from the reality of a multicultural society. And Ireland is and has been a multicultural society for a very long time, as any traveler will tell you, and as indeed David Stanton and uh, uh, championed the cause of Irish travellers getting their ethnicity acknowledged and recognised on the 1st of March 2017 in the Dáil. We are a multicultural society. Travellers and a number of black Irish people have been part of that multicultural society for a very long time. But we're on a journey towards an intercultural society where, as Orla reminded us earlier, there have already been some intercultural engagements. But creating a truly intercultural society requires a little more than that is, in, in my view. We need to do some other things as well. So who am I anyway? Uh, my starting points are as someone from rural Ireland, from County Meath. I know male people might not be very clear, are enthusiastic about that, uh, which is also one of the counties that had uh, various engagements with your county in football, uh, shall we say in Gaelic football, uh, but I, I, um, I start also as someone who worked for many years in community work with the Irish community in the UK, and that was where the collision for me between community work, integration, inclusiveness and racism became very, very clear. I worked in the UK right throughout the 1970s, and those of you, I'm sure there are many of you here, who like me were there in the UK then, will know that that was the time of the Birmingham Six, the Guildford Four, and the Maguire Seven. And those of us who fought far with and alongside them were very, very clear about the nature of racism and what it meant at an individual level, at an institutional level, and at a structural level in British society. And I think that, that experience was really important for me, both in terms of understanding that to create integration and to create inclusiveness, we also need parity of esteem, as uh, the minority groups in Northern Ireland have put it, and we'll have to put it again fairly soon, as we all know. We need parity of esteem, and we need conditions where people feel equal so that they can actually engage equally. And we certainly didn't have those as we struggled in the 1970s UK around those cases. All of which, for those of you who don't know, were uh, in the end exonerated. But I'm always reminded that if it had been 20 or 30 years previously, they would have been executed before they were exonerated because the death penalty would have been in place in those days. But in starting as well and acknowledging my own background, which took me on that journey, you may ask how did I get involved in all those highfalutin European and UN things. Well, to be honest, we got involved for a very simple purpose. In 1980s Ireland, when I came back here to work in Maynooth, inflicting myself on a number of people, including some in this room, in order to encourage them to become community workers and youth workers, um, I, became, I became horrified myself and my late husband, by the conditions in which travellers were living, and also by the discrimination and what we could only name as racism against them in Irish society. And there was no anti-racism legislation here, and it was difficult enough to secure their inclusion. So we set about working from the outside in, encouraging the European Union to have anti-racist legislation, which eventually came about in 1999. So that was how I got involved, for a very straightforward reason. And that led to other things, as things do. And then eventually I ended up at the UN, where I still stick my nose in every now and again. But enough about me. Um, I, I'd like to suggest, though, that we can't discuss this issue here in Ballyhawness without acknowledging the current global and national context in which we're placed. And the current global context 
is one of global migration and development. And as I'm sure Tony could tell you very easily, global migration normally happens within a region. In fact, frequently, more people move within one part of Africa than move from Africa to Europe or to any other part of the world. Um, so, can you hear me now? I'm given to understand I'm doing this wrong. Can everybody hear me? So, in fact, as in Europe and in Ireland, we berate the fact that there are too many hordes of people and we have a massive influx and all the rest. Utter rubbish. People move mostly in the region where they live. But secondly, we also need to acknowledge, as we face this discussion, that we have what's politely and in academic circles called a democratic deficit, i.e. we're not producing enough children to continue to look after our aging population, and I speak for myself among others, who we're not producing enough children and we won't be into the future. This is a trend in Europe. So in fact, we're cutting off our noses to spite our faces by not welcoming with open arms the people who are coming to our shores and creating <coughs> conditions where they contribute, can contribute the maximum. Um, I'd like to suggest as well though, Hello, is this one working okay? Yeah. I'd like to suggest also though that in this, um, in, this, in this current context, one of the things, and that's partly an answer to your question, Colette, that gives me hope, is the resilience of communities and the extent to which community participation and community development can create the conditions for the ground up from change. And in acknowledging that, I'd particularly like to acknowledge today the partnership between the department that takes the primary responsibility for supporting community development here, which is the Department of Rural and Community Development, and the Department of Justice and Equality, because I think that represents a really important coming together to make sure that the people and all of us who are part of creating an intercultural society can contribute to it and that we can, of course, through the day, remind them of the sort of resources that they need to put in to make the conditions that create the possibilities for that. Now, um, I'd suggest to you that integration and inclusion, far from being an automatic choice for communities, is in fact the road less travelled and I was very interested in some of the things that Tony was saying. And I fully agree with him that to really support integration and inclusion, we need to get outside our comfort zone. We need courage and commitment. We need to lose sight of the shore, as he said, in order to gain new lands and new spaces. And that, for me, means acknowledging that the structures, the organizations, and the frameworks we have may need to change. That our attitudes and our, the way we think our prejudices may need to change. And that maybe we also need to acknowledge that hidden somewhere is, in effect, racism. And I'm suggesting that all of us, irrespective of our background, are capable of that sort of thinking and that sort of response. Now, uh, <coughs> community development then, if we're going to use that method, and I'm going to just quote very briefly the Department of Rural and Community Development's definition as they've published in the recent strategy. It's about collective participation, empowerment, and decision-making towards social change which is about achieving equality, social justice, and human rights. And partly in answer to the question of the man at the back, I would say that social justice, human rights, and equality cannot be achieved unless one also addresses economic inequalities and the capacity of people to make a living. I was interested in some of the comments earlier about intercultural engagement. And I think sometimes for real intercultural engagement, that parity of esteem dimension needs to be added in. Uh, and the, the reality Sorry, that... Excuse me, if you lift up the mic, I can't hear you in the back. Sorry. I'm much better at shouting, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's clear where my background comes from. Um, 
the, the, the reality is that um, equality, social justice and human rights require also parity of economic esteem or the capacity to make a living which gives people not just equal opportunities but equal participation and the capacity to gain equal outcomes. But community development also needs to prior prioritise marginalised and minority communities. If it doesn't prioritise marginalised and minority communities, it's in danger of being a community initiative like the one in Uthrard recently, or it's in danger of being a community initiative like many of the initiatives that we've seen, or certainly I've seen around the country, against the, the, a halting site for travellers or against a group housing scheme for travellers. So you cannot talk about social change for equality and human rights unless you actually prioritise minority and marginalised groups and create the conditions for it to name the sustainable development goals that we're all so committed to and I'm glad to see a number of people wearing the badges. Create conditions where uh, nobody is left behind and where the most marginalised and those furthest behind are the ones which are actually targeted first. Uh, what's gone wrong now? Never mind. We'll just, we'll just keep going anyway. The next thing I wanted to talk about then very briefly is integration and inclusion. Um, for me, I think if we're to talk, and I won't redefine these things since they have already been well defined, Integration, in order to understand integration and inclusion, I think maybe it's worth taking a step back. The first, the first thing that a lot of people talk about when they talk about integration and inclusion, in effect, is assimilation. I remember when I first became involved in work with travellers, what the, the aim was that travellers would become settled. And some people to this day even use the term settled travellers. Now, as any traveller will tell you, there's no such thing as a settled traveller. You either are a traveller or you're not a traveller. Um, accommodation, then, is the next step. And that's not a bad step, maybe, but accommodation means that you accommodate or tolerate the, the, the group or the people from a different group in your society. But in the end, none of us just wants to be tolerated or put up with. We want conditions where we can feel equal and where we can actually be a full part of what's going on. Integration speaks about integrating the other, and Tony has defined it, and it is a useful way of looking at it. But I'd suggest to you that integration, in fact, is not enough, because in the end, we're not talking about people who come here for a while. We're talking about a totally changed new community. So what we need to talk about then is inclusion. And at the end of in Social Inclusion Awareness Week, I think it's really useful for us to talk about inclusion. What we need to talk about is an inclusive society. And if we're to talk about that inclusive society, we need to address the barriers to inclusion. And I suggested to you that the main barrier to inclusion is racism. And by an inclusive society, I mean a society, and you can get these things later, so don't worry about them. By an inclusive society, I mean a society which isn't just um, dependent on culture as if it was static. Because as Tony said, well, however it's defined, one of the key things about culture is that it's changing. And if we're just accommodating people, what we're trying to do is to desperately hold on and make sure that the key culture is our own culture. You know, instead of creating conditions where other cultures can resonate, where everybody who's part of a society can contribute to its future and to its culture and to shaping what that culture might mean. I know I'm out of time, but I'm going to take another few minutes anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I've, never, I've, never, I've never been known for, for, for doing the right thing. I'm going to sit well, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm suggesting that, that, that if, you, if you look, we have, our country, our state, has signed up to an understanding of racism, which says, when we signed the International Covenant on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And we said that it's an exclusion based on ethnic, national, or other origin, which has the purpose or effect of nullifying or impairing rights. Now, purpose.
purpose or effect is the bit that I want to stress because purpose is when it's done deliberately but effect is when it happens. And maybe I'm suggesting to you that in this journey towards an intercultural society and a fully intercultural Ballyhawness, that's the bit that we all need to take a look at. Where is it invisible? What's that bit where in effect what we're doing is racist? And if in effect it's racist, maybe we need to take a look at simple explanations that aren't too simplistic because one size does not fit all. And indeed, as Mark's survey and Orla's research has shown, there are differences and there are variations. We need to create conditions where women can maybe sit together. And as women, we know that if there weren't special measures that targeted women, uh, the likes of me wouldn't be standing here today. If there weren't special measures that targeted economic disadvantage and marginalization, a lot of us wouldn't be here today. So we need to kind of mark these things in a way that understands taking special measures is not about advantaging one small group over, over another. In fact, what it's about is creating a level football pitch. And finally then, to move to some, uh, a, a, a few very short conclusions and comments. I'd suggest you that, that move from multicultural realities to intercultural societies needs a lot of very <laughs> ordinary work on an ongoing basis. And I want particularly to commend you here in Ballyhawness for that ongoing work that you're taking on. And for the work that's been ongoing in Mayo as well, including work, the work of the Mayo Travellers Groups and the work of the other intercultural work that has, taken, that has taken place here. But I think this work also requires state support. We need to integrate it into the work of DRCD and we need more collaboration and cooperation and more sort of creative initiatives, in particular to address racism. We had a National Committee on Racism and Interculturalism, which I had the honor to chair. We called it against racism, but we wanted to say what we were for. And what we're for is an intercultural society. But we knew in order to get there that we needed to address the barriers. We can do so much ourselves, but we need now another national action plan to move us forward to an intercultural society which also addresses racism and supports the initiatives that you people are taking and that the local authorities can take and that the local training initiative, the local ETBs can take to move all of us <coughs> forward. And finally then, somebody asked about what can new communities themselves do. New communities themselves can claim their space, but they can only claim the space, and thank you for the question, you can only claim the space in as far as you're allowed to do it. And some institutional things are required in order to do that. Uh, the, the basis on which visas are offered, the basis on which people who claim the right to have their refugee status recognised or treated, those things need to be dealt with on a sort of a step-by-step -step basis. And we need also to hear your stories. I think hearing the stories and the individual uh, issues that are faced by migrant workers, as Celeste's story this morning, opens our ears and opens our eyes in a way that other things don't. Can I finish by saying, I wish you well. It's a, it's a road that all of us need to travel and all of us should travel with you. And I think collectively, using community development methods that are interlaced, not with a charity response, not with a response that's about pity or patronization, not with a response that allows our fears of someone who looks different or someone who is different, our fears to trump their rights. Fears are not rights. We, we should not try. And I use the term not letting our fears trump <coughs> their rights deliberately because one of the global exponents of trumping rights is in fact a man who bears that name. Uh, I think if we move forward like that, we have the collective capacity. We have made reasonable progress in Ireland. We do, unfortunately, have an alt-right in Ireland at this point in time, and it has asserted itself relatively recently. But we also have the capacity to understand that migration experience, because many of us have lived it, and many of us have lived its difficulties and its differentials. Thank you very much.